Good morning and a very warm welcome on this first Sunday after Trinity, or for those who observe it, Father's Day. Uh, please do be seated for the notices. Firstly, my thanks to those who supported last night's concert, and particularly to, the, to my fellow barmen and women who worked hard last night. Um, it was a long concert by our standards, but my word, wasn't it good? Um, and you had your money's worth. Um, for those that weren't able to be there, they're hoping to come back next year, so you have a second chance in 2023. Um, just one practical note, uh, my landline 742571 will be defunct after tonight. Uh, so to get hold of me, please would you use the number on the front of the parish news or the update, the mobile number, as my work number from tomorrow onwards. This afternoon, Bishop Stephen will be enthroned in the cathedral in a service beginning at three o'clock, and we're asked to be seated by half past two. So you're welcome to attend, but please be there to be seated by half past two for that service. I published the bands of marriage between Andrew Ross Gilfoyle and Emily Marie Dunford of the parish of Harnham, and with a qualifying connection to this parish. Also between Edward John Lewis and Sophie Rebecca Marquand of the parish of St. Bennet and All Saints, Kentish Town, and with a qualifying connection to this parish. If any of you knows a reason why these persons severally may not lawfully marry, you are to declare it. And these are both for the second time of asking. Please then remain seated as we begin our worship. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. We have come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world, and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may give ourselves to the service of God. Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image to the praise and glory of his name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God of truth, help us to keep your law of love and to walk in ways of wisdom, that we may find true life in Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. We stand now to sing our first hymn, In Christ There Is No East or West, hymn 679. Oh, 
A reading from St. Luke's Gospel. Jesus and his disciples arrived at the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. As he stepped out on land, a man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he did not live in a house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wilds. Jesus then asked him, what is your name? He said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now there on the hillside, there were a large herd of swine feeding. And the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swine herds saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now we sing the Benedictus, which you'll find towards the back of the booklet. Now bless the God of Israel.
please do sit down. The healing of the man possessed by demons is a familiar story. It crops up in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark and Luke as today. Familiar then, but it is a bit strange, isn't it? As you heard it just now, were there things in Luke's account that you found odd or unsettling? And do tell me, was there anything you found a little bit odd or you didn't like the sound of? It's a bit rough on the owners of the swine. She said it's a bit rough on the owners of the swine. It's a bit rough on the piggies too, isn't it? <laughs> I think so. Yeah. A reminder perhaps that when there is evil, there are very often innocent victims. It's not the pigs who possess the man, it's the demons that went into them. Yet they are drowned. They are the innocent victims. Perhaps they're there in the story to remind us um, that, well, bear in mind the Jewish perspective on pigs. For Jews, pigs are a no-no. You don't keep them, let alone eat them. So perhaps they're not too important to this gospel writer, I don't know. It does point out the fact that this good Jewish man is where he shouldn't be. Jesus has gone where he's needed, not just followed the rules. A rabbi should not be in a swine farm. He is. That's where he's needed, or nearby one. Anything else that's odd or unreasonable? Or are we terribly well pleased in this play? <laughs> Jesus allowed him to go. Yeah, he sent him away. I'll come back to that point later on, but he does. Jesus doesn't say, yeah, come on. He says, no, go away. Sounds a bit odd, doesn't it? Normally, Jesus doesn't say that. Thank you. Anything else? That, yeah, not Jesus. <laughs> the man with the demons, we would say, is mentally ill. I'm sure we would. And yes, their response is to chain him up. They've tried to chain him up several times, it said, didn't it? But they can't. Nick? Yeah, where did his clothes come from? <laughs> Does Jesus have a little supply? I don't know. That, that is, that's I haven't got that one. That's a curiosity. Yeah. <laughs> yes. We're told this is in the country of the Gerasenes, which we think, therefore, must be based on the town of Gerasa, or Gerasa, which is about 37 miles from the Sea of Galilee. So if Jesus steps out of the boat into Gerasa, he's got very long legs. And those poor piggies again, it's, it's a marathon and a bit, they run into the water. So why are we in Gerasa? Well, that was the place of a notorious rebellion, an attempt to overthrow Roman rule in that place that was suppressed very violent, violently by the Romans. And perhaps the fact that he calls the demons legion, a Roman word, not Greek or Hebrew, a Roman word, with connotations of the military, perhaps we're meant to see the demons as symbolizing the powers of oppression, the Roman army. Um, so that there's lots going on. So maybe that is why we have this odd geography, as you said, um, that it's in a place that's nowhere near the sea, nowhere near a lake. Um, okay. We've had this slightly violent, very unstable, naked man around the place, and suddenly here he is with these miraculous clothes and in his right mind, sitting all well behaved at Jesus' feet. Would you not think that those around him would be rather pleased? I think, thank goodness you're here, Jesus. Thank you for doing this. You've made our lives much calmer. What do they do to Jesus? Go away. Yeah, we don't want you here. You're a trouble causer. Odd response. Presumably, they are, they, as I said, they're, they're seized by great fear. Something has happened here. They were quite used to it as it was before. Actually, things have changed. There's something unsettling about things changing. Um, suddenly, this man represents something unusual. Both Jesus and the other man. Something unusual has happened. So in that change, perhaps something is odd. 
Perhaps the, tr the strangest thing for us today is that very notion of somebody being possessed by demons. It's not something we would tend to come across that often in Wilton Marketplace, for example. Our understanding of human illness and human nature has progressed in the last 2,000 years. And I suspect that if we did encounter a naked man living amongst the gravestones here, our first instincts would be to involve the police and mental health professionals, not expect me or anybody else to attempt an exorcism on him. And yet we possibly do see something like this rather more often than we think. If you dig behind the headlines, there are numerous examples, not just of individuals, but of whole groups of people who appear to be seized by irrational fears and suspicions of others, and who seem to be increasingly cut off from reality. Take, for example, the evangelical hatred that seethes among supporters of Donald Trump the inability of some Republicans and Democrats alike to view each other as anything less than enemies of their state. That, I suggest, is not normal. That is not rational behavior. Something seems to have taken hold, and it's not good. Near a home, the tendency fueled by some in the press to dehumanize those who don't quite fit in or who pose some kind of challenge to our own lifestyle. Often that has some irrational feel about it too. The idea that all those on benefits are scroungers and layabouts. The idea that asylum seekers are all chances after our jobs, if not potential terrorists. Those ideas are presented as fact more often than we like to think in a society that calls itself civilized. But they are not true. And whatever it is that leads people to swallow those ideas, that, I suggest, is not good. It is a very long time since the House of Bishops have been so publicly at loggerheads with the government. It's quite a long time since the House of Bishops were so united as they are at the moment. All of them are opposed to the policy of sending asylum seekers to Rwanda, where most likely they know no one and know not the language. And yet, we hear, this is a popular policy amongst many of our fellow countrymen and women. How many of them, I wonder, would have more sympathy for the fictional pigs in our story today than for these very real men and women made in God's image. How do hearts and minds become hardened in this way? Mass migration is a huge and very real problem, and there's no suggestion that there are any easy answers. But just trying to send the problem somewhere else will not solve it, any more than the garrison sending Jesus away could prevent his work continuing. Long-term solutions are going to need a transformation of attitudes and societies as radical as the transformation of the man possessed by demons. Healing the divisions and inequalities that fuel migration will be costly in many ways. It is easier to turn away or turn the problem away from us but that is not Christ's way. He engages with this man and restores him to his full human dignity, bringing him back into society. That is the challenge for us, with all who are now excluded. The other intriguing oddity about this story is that Jesus wins the most unlikely of converts, the most untouchable of untouchables, and a Gentile at that. This man turns to Jesus and wants to go with him. But, as was said, on this occasion there is no, come, follow me. Instead, Jesus sends the man back to his own people, 
and instructs him to tell them what has happened. Jesus makes him then an evangelist rather than a disciple, taking the good news of God's redeeming love to a people more responsive, perhaps, than those who gathered at Gerasa. And perhaps there's a message for us there too, and for our church, both locally and nationally. The most effective way of transforming societies for good, the most effective way of releasing people from the grip of irrational fear or prejudice, is not by 101 fresh initiatives or policy statements, is not by putting on a good and impressive show in order to impress people into believing, but by simple witness among our friends and neighbours. That might mean telling our own people how much God has done for us. Or it might be just simply turning up here on a Sunday and not being shy about letting our neighbours know where it is we go each week. Keeping alive the rumour of God, pointing beyond ourselves to the fellowship and dignity of all God's people, those are things we can all do in small ways or great. And that is the mission into which Christ invites us all. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The choir will now sing for us the anthem, We Cannot Measure How You Heal, the words by John Bell and an arrangement by Malcolm Archer.
Let us stand to affirm our faith, saying together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Loving Father, we pray for all your children, and especially those in particular need. For those who are unwell, anxious or uncertain, For those who feel excluded or ignored by society at large and those who are powerless to change their circumstances. May they and may we know your transforming power to heal. We pray for our government and all those in positions of leadership, that you would guide them in t tackling the many challenges that lie ahead. Let fear give way to hope, and guide us all to seek the common good in all things. We pray for your church and for Bishop Stephen as he begins his ministry amongst us. Guide and strengthen us to go where you need us, to speak the words you give us, and to witness to your love in our daily lives. We pray for our young people, especially for those entering the final week of public exams. For families, friends, and all our neighbors. Where there are tensions and broken relationships, pour your healing love. And where there are faithful friendships and stable relationships, pour your continued blessing. All this we ask through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Gathering our prayers into one, let us pray with confidence as our Saviour taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen.
Let us stand to sing our final hymn, number 818, To God Be the Glory. which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. <laughs>